Hey Crossing Church, so glad that you could join us here today. My name is Zach and I'm the Associate Pastor at The Crossing Church. Our desire is to help you take your next step with Jesus. And to do that, we have three links that you can use. First up, Crossing Connect. It's our digital connection card and you can let us know you've attended service today or let us know how we can be praying for you or use that to sign up and respond to any of the various opportunities to connect that we have here. Crossing Give allows you to partner with us in the ministry of The Crossing as we reach out to our community and to the world with the good news of Jesus. Crossing Central is the place where you're going to find everything that's going on from events to life groups to opportunities to serve. Hey, hope you enjoy the service today and I look forward to connecting with you soon. Thanks for coming. Good morning, church. My name is Kendall, and I have the privilege of being the lead pastor here at The Crossing. And if you are a guest with us today, thank you so much for joining us. It is my prayer that you will have an encounter with the living God because he is here and present. So you be present to him as well. Uh, wherever you are, just don't be just sitting there. Engage with your heart, your mind, your ears, your eyes, and be ready for whatever he has. One thing, and then we're going to dive in. We've been talking about our Christmas offering for the last six weeks. Our goal was to raise $25,000 to bless two local nonprofits and two international ones. And we not only reached our goal, but we exceeded it. We made $33,500 came in, and everyone in the studio is jumping up and down and cheering. Woo! <laughs> anyway, Pretty cool, and so uh, we're going to have a fun time sending out and blessing these organizations this week. Thank you so much for participating. Thank you for your generosity. All right, I think that's it. Let me pray, and then we'll dive in. Father, good morning. We thank you for this day. We thank you that you are for us, and you are with us, and by the power of Jesus, you can be in us. And so, Lord, I pray that as we open your word this morning, you will open our hearts and let us be listening for your voice and give us the courage to go where you call us to go. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Ran across an article this week called Strange Sports Team Names. I wrote a few of them down. We're going to start with the high school. There's a high school in Polka, West Virginia. Their mascot, their name, of course, is what? The Polka Dots. Ha, ha, ha. Avon, Connecticut. They're known as the Winged Beavers. <laughs> now, why would beavers need to fly? I'm not sure I can even picture a beaver with wings, but anyway, they're the winged beavers. There must be a story there. And then Centralia, Illinois are known as the Centralia Orphans. But get this, all their women's teams are called the Annies. So you got the orphan Annies, get it? All right, moving on to colleges, University of California, Irvine, Ant Eaters. Ooh, that's terrifying. I guess if you're an ant, that, that's really scary, but they're the ant eaters. University of South Carolina and Columbia are called the fighting koalas. Okay, my picture of a koala bear is just like they sleep a lot, right? So the fighting koalas, that doesn't work so much for me. University of Arkansas and Monticello are known as the boll weevils. Nasty insect. All right, my favorite, I think, is the University of California, Santa Cruz, Banana Slugs. <laughs> you wouldn't want to compete against their track team, now would you, the Banana Slugs? And then the last one, my final pick, is a college, community college in Scottsdale, Arizona. They are known as the Fighting Artichokes. Yes, tremble all ye vegetarians. Better be careful about those artichokes. But their logo, on the other hand, is awesome. Get a look at this one. Notice the evil eye in the bottom corner. It's like, wow, I would not want to come anywhere near that asparagus. <laughs> so we're in this series called The Journey Home. It's subtitled Getting Ready for What God Has Next, because sometime in the next few months, we are going to move into the new home that we've been dreaming about for so very long and so we're taking the months of January and February and a little bit into March to prepare our hearts and our minds and our souls and also to prepare our ministries and our systems and our volunteer teams. And we want to be as ready as we possibly can for the people that God's going to bring us once we get into our building. And so our goal by the end of this series is to raise up 50 new volunteers, 50 volunteer opportunities. Each one of them is mission critical. And here's what we're asking for is just give us nine months. 
Give us nine months in one of these positions, and in the meantime, we'll find people who are passionate and gifted and skilled and all that, but in between now and then, we need, to, we need a team of people who are gonna take and become these volunteers so that we can be as effective and strategic as we possibly can. Um, like I said, they're all mission critical. They're, none of them are weekly, and so we need you. And so if you haven't already started to do so, Start praying about, God, how do you want me to step on to this team? And and then when you're ready, let us know and we'll go. Our guidebook for this journey home is another journey home. It's found in scripture. It took place way back in 445 BC. It was by a man named Nehemiah. He's got a whole book written. Actually, he wrote it. It's his memoirs. He was a biblical leader to whom God gave a dream and who, against all the odds, actually brought that dream to life. And our goal is to to look at his life and learn what it looks like for us to walk into God's future for our church and to join his mission for us. Last week, we asked the question, what does it look like to step out in faith? Today, I want to ask the question, what happens when we step out together as a team? And hence the team jokes earlier. What does it look like for us to walk forward Together. Now, today we're in Nehemiah chapter 3. As a reminder, Nehemiah is a Jew. He's living in Susa, which is the capital city of the Persian Empire. He, along with the entire nation of Israel, they got captured, conquered by the Babylonians 150 years earlier. They got deported to Babylon, Babylonia, who then went, in turn was conquered by the Persians. Hence, they all live in the Persian Empire. Empire. Now, Nehemiah has discovered that Jerusalem, the holy city, the, the, the city of God, the, the spiritual and political center for the Jews is destroyed and its walls are in shambles. And so he believes, his heart is broken, and he believes that God is calling him to rebuild those walls. Last week, we saw that stepping out in faith entails risk. That as Nehemiah risked his life to ask his boss, the king of the Persian Empire, if he could travel to Jerusalem to rebuild the city walls. So the king says yes. Nehemiah takes the thousand-mile journey. Once he's there, he faces this daunting task because Jerusalem's walls are about a mile and a half in circumference. They're supposed to be 15 to 20 feet high, but all he's got is burned up, crumbling, worn out stones. It's an impossible task. How is he going to do it? In chapter 2, we saw him gather the leaders, and together he shares the dream with them, and they say, let's do it. So now in chapter 3, they actually begin. Let's see what we can learn. Nehemiah 3, verse 1, Then Eliashib the high priest and the other priests started to rebuild at the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set up its doors, building the wall as far as the Tower of the Hundred, which they dedicated, and the Tower of Hananel. People from the town of Jericho worked next to them, And beyond them was Zakur, son of Imri. By the way, here is a map of the wall that Nehemiah is building. So this is a map of of what the wall looked like around Jerusalem. It's got the gates, various gates labeled. And what I want you you to notice is that Nehemiah, in his description here in the story, he's actually just kind of working his way around the wall. He starts with the sheep gate. All right, that's where the sheep sheep were led from the temple for sacrifice. Thus the interest of the priests in rebuilding that part of the wall. Then he moves down to the Tower of the Hundred and the Tower of Hananel. And then next up is the Fish Gate. Verse 3. The Fish Gate was built by the sons of Hassanah. They laid the beams, set up its doors, and installed its bolts and bars. Merimoth, son of Uriah, and grandson of Hakaz, repaired the next section of wall. Beside him were Meshulam, son of Berechiah, and grandson of Meshezabel. And then Zadok, son of Ba'ana. Okay, stop for just a second. There are a lot of, okay, there's a lot of names in chapter three. Let me just warn you. But why are there so many names? And then there's this like, it's like Meshulam, son of Berechiah, grandson of Meshezabel. Meshezabel, say that. Ooh, it sounds like you sneeze. God bless you. Then Zadok, son of Ba'ana. Why do they say son of, son of, son of? Well, it's because it's their last name. All right, if it was today, we'd say Meshulam Berechiahson or Zadok Ba'anason. Now, For the sake of time, since there's so many son of, son of, we're just going to remove those. I'm editing them out as I read. It'll be a little more simple. So let's keep going. Verse 5. Next were the people from Tekoa. Though their leaders refused to work with the construction supervisors, we'll talk about them in a minute. The old city gate was repaired by Joeda and Meshulam. They laid the beams, set up its doors, installed its bolts and bars. Next to them were Melatia from Gibeon 
Jaden from Marinoff, people from Gibeon, and people from Mitzpah, the headquarters of the governor of the province west of the Euphrates River. Next was Uziel, a goldsmith by trade who also worked on the wall. Behind him, beyond him was Hananiah, a manufacturer of perfumes. They left out a section of Jerusalem as they built the broad wall. Now, what do you notice besides all the names as you read through these verses? Well, all the names that represent all the people, right? By the time we're finished with chapter 3, we're going to see 40 different groups of people working on this wall, which brings me to my first observation. It takes a team to build a wall. It takes a team to build a wall, and this is so very much in keeping with the way that God operates. See, whenever God does something, he nearly always does it through us, not just me. Okay, whenever God works, he almost always works through us and not just me. Over and over in scripture, we are reminded that as followers of Jesus, we do not stand alone. We are part of a family. We worship as a family. We give as a family. We serve as a family. And we do God's work as a family. And God works through us in ways that he doesn't work just through me. You know, sometimes we look at the great leaders in Scripture and, and we picture them kind of standing there stoically, alone, face to the wind, you know, rugged individualists just like us Americans or this cowboy from the old Marble cigarette commercial. <laughs> Problem is, that's not the actual reality. For example, who built the ark? Noah, right? Yes, well, but Noah had a wife and three sons, and each of his three sons were married and guess what? They all helped him build it. They all took flack from the laughing, mocking neighbors. It took a team to build the ark. How about Moses? Who led the Israelites through the wilderness? Moses? Yes, but look at Exodus 18, 25. Moses chose capable men from all Israel, made them leaders of the people, officials over thousands, hundreds, fifties, and tens. Was Mo the leader? Yup. Did he do it alone? Nope. It took a team to lead the nation of Israel. Most fascinating is Jesus. Even Jesus had a posse. First thing he does when he starts his ministry is he gathers his disciples and he teaches them and he leads them. And eventually he turns the whole thing over to them. It took a team to change the world the way Jesus wanted to change the world. You know, it takes a team for the Crossing Church to meet at East Ridge High School every Sunday. Every week, there are at least a couple dozen people, some of whom get here two, two and a half hours early to do lights and sound and slides and worship and drive the church truck and set up tables and flags and banners and signs and greet people and man the welcome table and ush people and help children encounter Jesus at their own level. It takes a team to do what God has called us to do. So I have a question. Why does God do it that way? Well, why a team? Well, obviously, be because there are things that we can't do alone, although technically God could, if he wanted, he could empower me, you, he could power us with special abilities so we could do it alone. But there's a huge theological reason that will never happen. Here it is. At the core, God actually exists in community. Okay, you've got the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. Okay, God is a we, not just an I. And everything God does, he does in the context of community. Now, Scripture says that we, you and I, we reflect God's image. And so God has hardwired us to live and serve and be in community and to do life with others and to build his kingdom forever and together. And the truth is we are never more alive than when we do God's work side by side with each other. We're never more alive when we're doing what God has called us to do together. It's who we are. So if the crossing is the team that God has led you to or is leading you to, will you get in? Will you say yes? Will you step in? All right, verse 9. Raphia, by the way, so many great names in here. If you're expecting or you have a grandchild on the way, pick a name from, from this list. Raphia, the leader of half the district of Jerusalem, was next to them on the wall. Next, Jediah, 
repaired the wall across from his own house, and next to him was Hattush. Then came Melkaija and Hashub, who repaired another section of the wall and the tower of the ovens. Shalom and his daughters repaired the next section. He was the leader of the other half of the district of Jerusalem. The valley gate was repaired by the people from Zenoa, led by Hanun. They also repaired the 1,500 feet of wall to the dung gate. What do you think that was for? Hmm. The dung gate was repaired by Malkaija, the leader of the Beit HaKerem district. The fountain gate was repaired by Shalom, the leader of the Mitzpah district. Then he repaired the wall of the pool of Siloam near the king's garden, and he rebuilt the wall as far as the stairs that descend from the city of David. Next to him was Nehemiah, not our hero, another guy named Nehemiah. Next to him, repairs were made by a group of Levites. Then came Hashabiah, leader of half the district of Kela. Next down the line were his countrymen led by Binwi, the leader of the other half of the district of Kela. Next to them, Eitzer, the leader of Mitzpah, repaired another section of wall. Next to him was Baruch, who zealously repaired an additional section from the angle of the door of the house of Eliashib, the high priest. Merimoth rebuilt another section of the wall extending from the door of Eliashib's house to the end of the house. Lots of details in this passage. Second observation. It takes a whole team to build a wall, not just a team. It takes the whole team. Look at this team. Look, look, look who it's made up of. Verse 1, it says the high priest, all right? He's the big kahuna, the, the key leader. Verse 2, it says the people of Jericho. That's a whole different city. Verse 5, it's the cranky people from Tekoa. That's another whole city. Verse 8, it's a goldsmith and a perfumer. Verse 12, it's Shalom and his daughters. Verse 14, it's Melchijah, who's a ruler, along with several other rulers. Verse 17, it's the Levites. They were the worship leaders. That's a lot of diversity. And so you take all of these people and you put it together and you have rich and poor and skilled and unskilled and men and women and boys and girls and professionals and volunteers. Some of them have great expertise. Some of them only have energy, <laughs> but they all participate. They all take a part of the wall. I love verse 20. It says, Baruch, who zealously repaired an additional section. No word if he was any good at it, <laughs> but he had a great attitude and lots of energy. It takes a whole team to build a wall. In other words, and this is important, there's no such thing as an unimportant or unnecessary team member. There's no such thing as an unimportant or an unnecessary team member. If you are on the team, you are needed. We can't do it without you. And this message is one that we often need to hear, especially regarding our gifts and our skills and our abilities. Sometimes we compare ourselves to others, our roles and our abilities, and decide we fall short. You know, like I can't speak like so-and-so, or I can't lead worship, I can't sing, I, I can't lead a group. I'm just a newcomer to faith. I haven't even read the whole Bible for Pete's sake. I have nothing to offer. Listen to me. That is a lie. Nothing could be farther from the truth. If you are a follower of Jesus, the fact is that he has gifted you to build the wall. He has given you gifts for kingdom building. First Corinthians 12 or 7 just comes out and says it. It says a spiritual gift is given to each of us, each of us, so we can help each other. Fact is, in God's kingdom, there's no such thing as a person with nothing to offer. There's no such thing as a follower of Jesus who is not called to join him in his work. You are never too old or too young or too new or too inexperienced or too broken or too late or too far gone or too far anything. Jesus has gifted you and your job is to explore your gifts and discover where he's leading you and how he wants you to use you to build the great wall of his kingdom. Jesus invites you to join him in what he's doing and to help bring his transforming power into the lives of those around you, into the lives of those around our church. Now, notice that not everyone takes the same amount of wall. Verse 13 says the people of Zenoa took 1,500 feet. That's like 20% of the entire project. Others just take a piece of the wall or a half a house. But also notice that when everybody takes the part of the, God, the wall that God directs them to, that's how the wall gets built. Everyone does their 
parts. Some take a big chunk, some take a medium-sized chunk, some take a small chunk, all in keeping with their abilities and their availability. And together, God uses them to build the wall. Same thing's true for us. We all have different abilities, different resources. We can't all give the same amount. We can't all participate at the same level. But when each of us serves in the way God leads us to and takes the piece of the wall that's ours, then the wall gets built. As we each serve the way God leads us and we take the piece of the wall that's ours, then the wall gets built. Now, it does entail sacrifice. Every person who was part of Nehemiah's wall, guess what? They worked their tails off. They got blisters. They got sore. They got sunburned. They got hot. There likely were some injuries. It cost them to be part of it. But together, they finished it. And the key here is everyone on the team participates. There are no, it's not a spectator sport. Nobody sits back and watches. Every one of us genuinely wrestles with which part of the wall is God calling me to take on. And again, if, if you haven't started, will you, will you pray? Will you ask God how much of the wall he wants you to build? Lord, what, what is my role in, for, in what you have for us together next as a church? Because everyone on the team took part of the wall. That's what God does through us together. All right, one last passage. Again, lots of names. Verse 22, the next repairs were made by the priests from the surrounding region. After them, Benjamin and Hashub repaired the section across from their house. Azariah repaired the section across from his house. Next was Binwi, who rebuilt another section of the wall from Azariah's house, the angle in the corner. Palal carried on the work from a point across the angle. Next to him were Padiah and the temple servants living on the hill of Ophel, who repaired the wall as far as a point across from the water gate to the east and the projecting tower. Then came the people from Tekoa, who apparently, even though they were cranky, they worked really hard because they worked on another part of the wall too, who repaired another section across from the great projecting tower and over to the wall of Ophel. Above the horse gate, the priests repaired the wall. Each one repaired the section immediately across from his own house. Next, Zadok also rebuilt the wall from his house. And beyond him was Shemaiah, the gatekeeper of the east gate. Next, Hananiah and Hanun repaired another section while Meshulam rebuilt the wall across from where he lived. Melchijah, one of the goldsmiths, repaired the wall as far as the housing for the temple servants and merchants across from the inspection gate. Then he continued as far as the upper room at the corner. The other goldsmiths and merchants repaired the wall from that corner to the sheep gate. And we are back where we started, right? We've just done a walk along the entire wall and we've met all the people who had a hand in building And here's the third observation I want to make. It takes a kingdom-focused team to build a wall. It takes a kingdom-focused team to build a wall. Again, look at all the different kinds of people here. There are, there are 40 different groups, and they're working on the wall at the same time. And each group represents different interests, different perspectives, different politics, different agendas. The priests are concerned about one thing. The rulers are concerned about something else. The merchants, something else still. And we see a little bit of the potential tension, you know, with those cranky Tekoans, okay? It says their leaders refused to work with the construction supervisors. That was a clash between the old leadership and the new. And, and it had the potential to derail the whole project, but it didn't. Because by God's grace, they understand that rebuilding the wall is more important than their agendas, more important than anything else. And so they put aside their differences for the most part. And this is the truth. To build a God-sized wall and to accomplish a God-sized dream, it requires each of us to lay down our personal self-interest for the sake of the team and the larger task of building God's kingdom. If I want to pursue God's dream, then I have to choose an attitude of how can I help? How can I serve? How can, how can we move forward together? And I have to come with the idea that, that my ideas and my dreams and my priorities are not nearly as important as God's agenda and God's dreams and God's priorities. To build a wall, each of us, surrenders ourself. We lay down our agenda at the foot of the cross and we make ourselves available to Jesus and his kingdom. Jesus himself talked about this 
Matthew 6, 33, it says, Seek the kingdom of God above all else. And live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. And here's the thing. When we do that, when we seek God's kingdom first together, it opens something up in the spiritual realm, and God's power flows, and God's kingdom comes. That's how it worked for Nehemiah. That's how it will work for us as we step out in faith together, focused on the mission that God has given us. You know, this whole chapter in Nehemiah reminds me of the old, old-fashioned barn-raising thing, you know, where the neighbor would invite all his friends and they would put a barn together in a day. Well, I read a story about that this week. It's from way back in 1988, Bruno, Nebraska. There's this farmer. His name was Herman Austria. This is actually a picture of him and his wife at their 50th wedding anniversary. I don't know when that was. Anyway, Austria's barn floor was under two and a half feet of water because of the rising creek, and he needed to move his entire 17,000-pound barn to a new foundation about 150 feet away. So what did he do? He asked a few friends to help. His son, Mike, devised this lattice work of steel tubing, and then he nailed and he bolted and he welded it on the inside and on the outside. Here's a picture of the contraption that this guy built. There were hundreds of handles attached, and on July 30th, 1988, after one practice lift, 344 volunteers slowly walked the barn up a slight incline, each of them supporting less than 50 pounds. And in just three minutes, the barn was on its new foundation. <laughs> kind of amazing, isn't it? Matter of fact, somebody wrote a children's book about it. It's called Farmer Herman and the Flooding Barn, a story about 344 people working together to solve a big, big, big problem. <laughs> You know what? There are 10,000, there are 100,000 stories like that in God's kingdom because that's how God works. God uses us together to bring his presence and his healing to a broken world in ways that he doesn't use me by myself. Folks, we can do so much for Jesus and his kingdom when we work together. Together. And so here's my question for you right now. What's your part of the wall? What's your part of the wall? If you're local, if you're near us, come help us. Get ready for what God has next. And you know what? Even if you live far away, hey, there's a lot of stuff we can do remotely. And so, hey, you can come help us. All right. So email me, Kendall at thecrossingchurch.org, and we will get you set up and ready. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're part of the team, and you were invited and called to be part of what God is doing, what's your part? All right, let's pray. Father, I thank you that you are always at work, and that you take great joy and delight in inviting us to join you in your work, and not just us as individuals, but us as a team, us as a church. Lord, we know that you have work for us to do as a church, and we want to do it. And so I pray that you will enable us to do it together, that you will, that you will lead us, that you will equip us, that you raise up the leaders that we need. And Lord, as we step out together, would you fill us with your joy, the joy of seeing you work, the joy of being part of your work, the joy of you working not only in us, but also through us. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll talk to you soon.